Hello and welcome to the Handmade Arcade Project. For the price of one of these, you can build three of these. So let's put the Y back in DIY and build not just one or two or three or four or five, but six because I need a good thumbnail. These are console arcades, which have a mix of genuine hardware and the occasional Raspberry Pi or Windows PC because variety is the spice of making things difficult. Plans are available for this cabinet design if you want to build one yourself. Here's a really brief overview of the CAD and the design. The cabinet scale is two thirds of full size. This translates to 53 inches tall, 16.6 inches wide, and almost 29 inches deep. You can either stand up and play with the riser or sit down comfortably and play with the chair. The cabinet has a extended control panel from the body, which accommodates your legs if you want to sit down and play. Design inspiration is a glorified kiosk, like an entertainment center from the 90s, but it's disguised as an arcade cabinet. Using the interior shelves, this cabinet creates a comfy home for up to two consoles and a monitor of your choice. There are two cable management areas, one at the bottom and another just below the monitor support shelf. This allows you to hide power adapters, cables, and excessively long cords out of sight. Finally, if you cut all the interior panels to 15 inches wide, which is what's shown here, this cabinet style and proportions can fit either two types of monitors, a 13 inch CRT or a 17 inch LCD. Either display can be accessed from the rear of the cabinet for service or replacement. You can also change the monitor bezel if you want to switch the monitor type at any point in the cabinet's lifespan. Versatility is key here since we are relying on old monitors that may not last forever. Since monitors come in many shapes and sizes, this ledge uses adjustable legs with a 5 16 inch bolt to allow the monitor height relative to the bezel cutout and angle to be adjusted for a better fit. My best advice is obtain the monitor first. That will guide you to which specific monitor bezel to cut and build. You could wait until the last build step to cut the bezel, which sort of happened to me while trying to source some new old stock monitors. And because of this, I changed the design. So either a 13 inch or 17 inch bezel could be installed with pocket screws. Again, you can even change the bezel at any point in the arcade's service life. It's just four screws holding the bezel in place. And this provides the cabinet with flexibility to accommodate most monitors in these size categories. Going back to the overall design, this was designed in CAD, so this could be easily cut on a CNC. You can export all the parts to a paper template instead, but a CNC makes things easier if you plan on building more than one. This CNC operation or toolpath takes about 65 minutes on this machine. Cut time depends on your CNC, tools, and material. Speaking of, the material being used is 3 quarter inch furniture grade plywood. The cost of wood comprises the majority of the total cost to build one of these arcade cabinets. Expect to use about 1.3 full size 8 by 4 foot sheets to build one cabinet. After the cutting operation, I sand all the parts on the CNC bed. Everything is still held in place so I can take care of sanding on one entire side. Most of the cabinet parts are still attached with tabs so next they are cut and separated from the sheet using a jigsaw. These tabs are cut off using a flush trim bit and any remaining sanding is done on the individual parts. Remember to save all the cutoff sections from the CNC sheet. This material will be used for the rectangular panels of the cabinet, which are not CNC cut, but table saw cut. This is because it's simply faster to cut rectangular stuff on a table saw. At this point, the side panel edges are all uniform, so I route the T-slot with the router on both pieces. This T-slot has a 3 16 wide barb, and the manufacturer says to cut a 1 16 inch slot, which is what I'm doing here. At this point, we can glue all the blocking sections to the left and right side panels. Dowels are used for alignment. Note the CNC drilling operation does not drill through the side panels completely. I made this change until after I noticed on an older cabinet, the dowels swell when they take paint and then eventually shrink below the surface after about a year. It's a minor imperfection, but it's an improvement that's been made on newer cabinets. 
the wood dowels that aligned and support all the blocking no longer poke through the side panels. I use a table saw to cut the remaining rectangular panel sections of this cabinet. The glue up is the hardest part in the construction process. Two people is nice to put the initial panels together, but you can manage with one person and some planning. You'll just need a few clamps in either regard. While cutting the rest of the square body panels, there are some tricky angles in this cabinet. The worst being this supplementary angle section at the rear. Thankfully, the benefit to a CAD model is we know the exact angles needed, they just have to be cut to length with some care. Many of the angled sections lead to these three access panel openings in the cabinet. The access panel dimensions can be adjusted for any fudge factors when you're in the building and cutting process. The access panels can be latched with whatever hardware you choose. I like to keep finishing, which is painting, pretty simple. I recommend you wood putty and sand any imperfections on the body surface and then prep for paint. Both a quality primer and top coats are recommended. Follow your paint instructions and don't cheap out on the nap roller either. A roller will ensure a uniform surface texture as opposed to a brush. I prefer paint over a full vinyl graphic overlay as an aesthetic choice that leverages the marquee I'm planning for these cabinets. These are console themed arcades, so the console logo and associated brand colors is the prominent thematic point. This is to elicit recognition from the console's library and not just a specific game or from a collage of characters like whatever this is. Speaking of marquee, I made the marquee by redrawing the respective console logo and typeface with some edits, laser cutting this and then painting it black. I also made this PCB to drive some addressable LEDs which illuminate the marquee. These potentiometers help me dial in the color while reading the red, green, and blue values which are then hard coded in the program. The color typeface on this example marquee is difficult to get color separation that matches the original logo design. So instead I'll just make this section a rainbow animation which is again a benefit of this PCB driving the LEDs in the marquee. This SNES logo is a better illustrated example of why direct RGB color is important. Specific sections of the marquee that idle as separate colors require a barrier so there's no light bleed. There is a barrier between the Dreamcast logo and its text similar to the SNES logo and the Nintendo text. Circling back to that glorified kiosk as inspiration, both open shelves of the arcade cabinet have a tiny LED light in the corner to illuminate the console or whatever you want to show off. The entire inside is also painted white, not just to reflect that white, but it also seals the wood so it does not absorb moisture, say if you store this in a basement. The speakers and amplifier are all new old stock. New old stock is more economical with a bit of effort. This is a cost saving example, so your mileage will vary. I found these era appropriate desktop PC speakers at a cost well below their individual component parts. I cut off the amplifier and button panel from its integrated speaker enclosure. Then I drilled some holes and added some speaker terminals for a modular speaker connection. Using some metal brackets, I mounted this amplifier assembly in a non-conspicuous but reachable place. Though the included speakers would have worked, I did replace them with some new old stock Sony speakers instead. These have a better frequency response and I suspect better shielding, which is important for tube televisions from back in the day. I drilled a pair of three inch diameter holes under the marquee and insulation is just a layered sandwich of a laser cut bracket, the speaker, and a 90 millimeter PC fan grill to keep fingers away from the speaker cones. This stack up and choice of fan grill keeps everything modular, affordable, and it's all fastened with four long bolts for each speaker.
The control panels are all custom and their unique features depend on the console. At the simplest, they are a layered laser cut wood and acrylic panels with a poster artwork layer in between. Any USB keyboard encoder would be sufficient for a Windows or Raspberry Pi application. For inputs like the Sega Genesis, I made hardware copies of the original controller wired to the console. For Dreamcast controls, I did a pad hack as reverse engineering a controller is too much of a task for one-off arcade machines. You can go a step further and route two different console controllers into one control panel. I used a pair of network switches to switch between Genesis and a Sega Dreamcast controller input so I can have a two-in-one console arcade. The wiring gets pretty involved, but it's worth it to have both console libraries in one arcade machine. Other input examples are I wanted to make a modification for playing console games on an arcade control panel. Many console games that utilize a traditional D-pad may not translate well to a eight or four way joystick. So I made a custom PCB that mirrors an arrow key layout and wired this in parallel with the arcade joystick. Platformers can be played with the traditional arcade joystick or where more precision is required for say like Tetris, the arrow key layout can be used as well. You can switch between either one on the fly. Some games that translate very well into a arcade hybrid setup is Guitar Hero. This control panel was made with a PlayStation 2 Guitar Hero controller and some added circuitry. Two rows of buttons are available for rapid inputs and the slightly modified circuit also triggers a strum button whenever a fret button is pressed. Having swappable control panels was a planned feature in the cabinet design, so storage for an extra control panel fits on this rear sloped access panel on the back of the arcade. Be sure to match this dimension from the CAD plans if you are storing an extra control panel. My last control panel trick is something of a subjective taste. Let's say you have an itch for playing some Nintendo 64, however that analog stick and its force use and lack of D-pad support in almost every game is something you want to avoid. Well, I've solved that too. This PCB is the lazy solution to converting digital to analog control using a voltage divider circuit for the X and Y axes. Doing something like this can be tricky as many consoles don't adopt the standard for the polarity of the X or Y axes. What I mean is one console's analog input will say zero volts on the Y axis corresponds to down, while on another console it could be up. So this PCB lets you pick the ground and VCC polarity for either axis. This control input PCB also enables up and down and left and right simultaneous inputs, which not every game knows what to do with, so that's another feature. What does this all mean? You basically can use D-pad input controls for the entire N64 library, whether it makes sense or not. I was planning on also building a control panel for the Nintendo GameCube to do the exact same thing, but the N64 is just way better, so why look back? Actually, I have one more unnecessarily complex control panel. This Sega-themed arcade uses four backlit key switches to toggle on and off the main parts of the arcade. That's the interior lights, the marquee, the game console, and the audio amp. I don't recommend this as the core of the arcade's functions are literally wired to the control panel, so that hot swap feature isn't a go, but it's still cool nonetheless. So what does this all cost to actually do? In time it takes to build one, it usually takes about a week. Here's a general breakdown of costs. The cost breakdown here is really just to build one cabinet, get it painted and finished. Things like furnishing the consoles are an assumption of you wouldn't really start this project unless you already own those consoles, so they're not counted in the total cost. While we're on the topic of costs, what does it cost to run one arcade for one hour? What about six arcades for one hour? I've got a kilowatt meter measuring this power strip powering all the arcades. And here's the power usage for all six machines for one hour. 
electricity costs in my area are the following. And running this basement arcade for one hour costs me this much. I have some other videos explaining in depth the specific build nuances and features for many of the individual themed arcades shown here. Each one is worth watching if you're looking for details on the control panel or other details I just didn't cover in this video. I'm going to leave you with the beeps and boops of a small handmade arcade, and I do thank you for watching.